good to see everybody. You guys can take a seat. For those of you who don't know me, my name is April Colquitt. I am our Wellspring Kids Director. And um, today I have the privilege of putting on a little bit different hat. I get to open our brand new series today for 2019. So I'm excited to be here with you guys. I hope you had a great Christmas and a happy new year and that you've kicked off 2019 with a bang. Um, how many of you got some new technology or new gadgets this Christmas? Anybody? Get some new phones, new watches. I don't know. I've been hearing a lot about the Amazon Echo or the Echo Dot thingy. I've talked to a lot of people that got those. I don't really know quite what that is, but apparently a lot of you got that for Christmas. Um, my kids got a green screen for Christmas. A green screen complete with a light set, like umbrella lights and stuff. So I'm expecting an epic movie to come out of the Colquitt household this year. If it's good enough, I might share it with you. You might get to hear more about that later. Um, I'm not really so much of a technology girl. I appreciate what technology can do, and it's not that I don't like it. I just don't know a whole lot about it or how to use it. Um, and the reason that I bring that up is because I kind of want to share a story with you today about my inexperience with technology. I don't know if you've ever seen our Wellspring Kids environments, but we have a stage in there, and it has lights and sound equipment and all that stuff. Not on this scale, but it's much more scaled down and, and simplified. It's appropriate for kids. But we have these things like this. If you don't know what this is, this is a light. And um, we have actually five of these particular kind of light. And these things have been around for a long time. I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but it's a little beat up. Can you see how it's not perfectly round? It's actually bent in on the side right here. We've had these lights since our days in the movie theater at Broadway at the Beach. So they've been around the block a time or two, and they certainly have been set up and torn back down more times than I care to count. And so they're pretty beat up. And at one time, these lights worked, and eventually they just stopped working. Now, as I said, I don't know a whole lot about technology, but I did try to fix these lights when they stopped working, which basically means I, um, I went as far as unplugging them and plugging them back in. <laughs> That's what you do when something doesn't work, right? You turn it off, you turn it back on, maybe tap it a time or two and talk sweetly to it, but it didn't work. And um, I told some people who know more about this kind of stuff than I do, but honestly, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a lot, of a lot of technology around this building, and this little light just kept getting pushed down on the list of priorities, and so it just never got fixed, and it just kind of sat there not working for a long time, and um, so fast forward to this past fall, our Wellspring Kids team acquired a new volunteer, and her name is Aubrey. And Aubrey is awesome, and I love her so much because she knows things about technology and audio equipment that I do not and never will. And so Aubrey's goal was to come onto our team and help us kind of tidy up some things in our kids' environments and um, help us make things better. And wouldn't you know, the first thing Aubrey said to me was, April, I've noticed that there's these lights on the stage that don't work. Can you tell me about those? I said, oh, those haven't worked for a long time. And she said, why are they still there? And I said, oh, well, you know, I kind of just forgot about them. We were going to fix them one time, and then we just got busy, and they've just been sitting there for so long that I just kind of forgot about them. But they definitely don't work, and you need to move them out of here. Let that be your first priority. Just get rid of those lights. So Aubrey said, okay, I'll take care of it. And then about a week later, Aubrey came to me, and she said, April, I have something to show you. And I said, okay. So I follow Aubrey to theater, the theater one where our kindergarten and first and second graders meet, and I walked in and these lights were working. I could not believe it. I thought for sure these lights were done and headed for the trash. And when I say they were working, they weren't just working a little bit. They were working a lot, like totally doing all the tricks. And so I want to show you actually what these lights can do. Check this out. Well, 
They've made a world of difference. And so the thing is that Aubrey had noticed that when the equipment was plugged in and turned on, these lights would just give a quick little like, boop, like a quick on and off, like you could barely see it. And so she rightly assumed that they must not be done yet. And so one day she and her boyfriend, Aaron, took a few moments to just turn a dial back here and make a couple of adjustments. And then voila, they worked. It was all it took. I could not believe it. But because Aubrey took the time to make sure these lights weren't truly done yet, it changed the whole environment in our Wellspring Kids room. It affected the whole atmosphere. And I love it. It's made such a difference. So here's the thing. I think that we might have some people in our lives who are like these lights. People who we think are broken and hopeless and we aren't doing anything to help. People who have been hurting or broken for so long that we've kind of forgotten about their hurt. Do you know anybody like that? Is there anybody that you know who's been hurting for so long, whose life has been broken for just long enough that you've stopped seeing it? You know it's there, but you're not doing anything to help. Maybe it's a coworker who you walk right by their desk every day or a person in your neighborhood you drive right by their house on your way in and out every single day. And you know something's not quite right, but you don't want to ask about their problems because let's be honest, we have all got our own junk to deal with. And you probably assume that you don't have the kind of help that they need anyways, and you certainly don't have the time to devote to them. I wonder, who are the broken lights in your life. See, I think we all have them. People who we've kind of just given up on. And we think it's hopeless. People who we see need help, but we aren't doing anything to help yet. Maybe there's a person, maybe it's a group of people, someone in our community, and you know they need help. You feel bad for them and you feel pity, but you aren't doing anything to help them yet. What if there was something else you could do? Maybe you've said, I'm gonna pray for them. You should be doing that. But is there anything else you could do? What if there was something you could do that that person would say, my life is better because of that? Every month in Wellspring Kids, we learn something called a life application skill. What that means is we look at a characteristic and we examine it with our kids and we see what does God have to say about this characteristic and how can we apply it to our lives. And it just so happens that in December, our life application skill, I just said that really country, life application skill, I spent a lot of time in Alabama over the holidays in my country. Always comes back when I've been there. Uh, but our life application skill in December was compassion. And see, we always think of compassion as a feeling or an emotion. Some of you in here would say, I'm a compassionate person. I cry when I watch sad movies, and when my friend receives bad news, I feel really bad for them. And others of you would say, I'm not compassionate. I just want to pat somebody on their back and tell them to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and just keep going. You know you're not the most compassionate person in the room, but you're not heartless either. We all know what it is to feel for someone else. But when we studied compassion last month in December with our kids, here's how we defined it. I want to show you, show you this. Caring enough about someone else's need to do something about it. And let me tell you, <laughs> We're teaching that to our kids, but I'd be lying if I said that didn't strike me too. Caring enough about someone else's need to do something about it. See the key word here, key phrase, do something. Do something. Do you care enough about someone else's need to do something or do you think compassion is just a feeling? Because I would argue that compassion is more than a feeling. It's more than just feeling for someone. It's more than just having that soft spot in your heart. It's more than just crying 
for a friend. Certainly, we do that. But if we really want to learn about compassion, I want to show you who had the most kind of compassion, and it's Jesus. And I want to share a story with you today about the kind of compassion that Jesus had. But before we do, I want to tell you that I've been thinking about this a lot since December when we studied compassion with our kids. And last fall, we spent learning how to be better citizens of heaven. How many of you were here for Citizen X? Several of you were. And if you weren't, I want you to go back to our website and catch up on what Trey taught. Because we learned things like it's not us versus the world. It's us for the world. And we're not at war with the world. We're here to rescue the world. If we really want better for people, we have to be better towards people. We learn that our help validates our hope. And as Trey taught that series, he often talked to us about people who stand on the other side of the issues from where we are, people who we would say cause friction in our lives or we might even see them as enemies. And those are all awesome principles, and we need to live by those. But don't those same principles also apply to the broken lights in our life, to the people who've been overlooked and their needs have been forgotten? If we want better for others, we have to be better towards others. Our help validates our hope. And so as we move into this new year in 2019, I wonder if any of us have considered that if our hope, our help validates our hope, if our help validates our hope, doesn't that also mean that our hope requires us to go where help is needed? See, for those of us who call ourselves citizens of heaven, who call ourselves Christians, The kind of hope we have means we can't treat the needs of people like these broken lights I told you about. We can't pretend they don't exist. We can't neglect or forget to help the needs of people. As citizens of heaven, simply knowing there is a need is not enough. Just acknowledging that it's there and moving on won't change anything, will it? And I think that you might have some people in your life who need help. Some people who you know there's a need there and you haven't done anything yet to help. But what if you could? What if we all would have the kind of compassion that is caring enough to do something about it? And the best example that we can look at, what we always tell our kids about our life application skills, if we really want to know what this looks looks like, the best place to go is to the Bible. And in this case, the best place to go is the life of Jesus. And so I want to share with you a story that I read many months ago in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And I think This is the perfect example. As we dig into this story and look at it really closely, it's a great example of the kind of compassion that Jesus had. And it's found in the Gospel of John, so if you're following along in your Bible or in your um, Bible app on your phone, turn to John chapter five. And um, this book is written by one of Jesus' disciples named John, of course. And he walked with Jesus and he was with him throughout his ministry. And as he opens this story in chapter five, They have been traveling through Galilee, and John tells us this. He says, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Now, this is important because Jesus is going back to his home base in Jerusalem for a specific reason. He's got somewhere to go. And John doesn't specify which holy day it is, but the point is, Jesus is on his way to somewhere else. He's got a schedule. And then John tells us, Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Now, basically what he's saying is there's a pool. The sheep gate indicates that it's right near the entrance of the city. So as Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, he would have seen this pool upon entering. And it's surrounded with these five decks, like these covered areas. It makes me think of the city pool. 
I grew up, when I was growing up, I don't know if city pools are much of a thing anymore in most places. I think we've probably learned a little bit about hygiene since then. Um, but the city pool where I grew up was crowded with people all of the time. And if my brother and sister and I begged my mom just enough, she would have compassion enough to take us to the city pool in the summer. And so she hated taking us there because it was covered with kids and parents and it was a crazy place. This is not that kind of city pool. John says this city pool is crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, who lay on the porches. So this is a city pool where all the sick people come to hang out. People who are blind and can't walk, they're paralyzed in some way, and the reason why they hung out at this pool is because there was water in the pool that was this mineral-rich water, and at certain times of the day, that water would bubble up. And the people believed that if they could go into that water when it bubbled up, that it had the ability to heal their diseases or to give them relief from their pain. And so that's where all the sick people would gather, is around this pool of Bethesda at the, at the front of the city. And John tells us, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Now, 38 years is a long time. I'll be 38 this spring. I know for some of you in here, you're thinking, I'm still a spring chick. <laughs> but 38 is a long time to be sick. 38 years? And so what strikes me about this passage is that this man did not ask Jesus for help. Jesus initiated the help. He asked him, would you like to get well? And so I'm, I think two things when I read that. A, this man didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't recognize him or know anything about him, and that he had the potential to heal him. But more importantly, he didn't ask for help because he'd given up hope of getting any help. I mean, after 38 years, wouldn't you think he would get tired of asking for help and not getting it? And so maybe as Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem that day and he walked by this pool and saw crowds of people, he couldn't help but notice the one man who needed help the most. And he couldn't pass by that one man who was so desperate for help without asking, would you like to get well? And it's almost like he just says it so casually, would you like to get well? And look at what the man says. I can't, sir, for the sick man said, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Can you hear the hopelessness in his voice? I can't. No one will help me. I've tried. I've been here 38 years. Can't get anybody to help me. He is hopeless. He is helpless. And Jesus takes notice. And he can't help but help this man. Look at how Jesus responds. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Instantly, he was better. Now, I said already that he didn't recognize who Jesus was. He must not have recognized who he was because certainly he would have asked for help. He was banking on that pool to help him get well. And so the reason that that's important and you can't miss that part of the story is because Jesus could have just kept walking that day, couldn't he? He was on the way to somewhere else. He had somewhere to be. He was going to a party. And he could have easily kept going and that man would have been none the wiser. He would have just seen Jesus as another man passing by, not helping. Just another day in the life of being sick. But Jesus saw how desperate he was for help and he couldn't help but take action. That is the kind of compassion that Jesus had. So what I'm saying to you today is that if you call yourself a citizen of heaven, if you say you're a Christian, and if Jesus is your standard, here's what you've gotta know. Your compassion will be confirmed by your action. If Jesus is your standard, your compassion will be confirmed by your action. It's more than just a feeling, compassion is. 
The kind of compassion that Jesus had caused him, it motivated him to do something about it. It wasn't enough to just see the need of that man who was so desperate and keep going. As I said, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I've studied the story a lot. And this is something that I've been working on in my own life, and it isn't easy. I haven't gotten there yet. And the reason it's so difficult to have that kind of compassion, the kind of compassion that moves you to take action, is because oftentimes it's very inconvenient. I mean, take this one story. Jesus was on his way to somewhere else. He had somewhere to go. He had an agenda, just like you and I do. But so many times in scripture when we see Jesus helping someone, he's in the middle of doing something else. I don't know if you've noticed that, if you've read the gospels enough to know, but oftentimes Jesus was in the middle of teaching or he was on the road traveling to somewhere else when he would stop, detour, and help someone else. Or he would allow his life, his plan, to be interrupted in order to help someone who had a need. And that's why I know that the kind of compassion that Jesus had always took an action to follow and meet that need. The kind of actions that can confirm our compassion can look like a lot of different things. I mean, it could be taking a meal to somebody. It could be serving at a love and be event. It could be, um, you know, driving a neighbor to a doctor's appointment. It could be making an actual phone call to check on a friend, not just in a text, but to make a phone call and say, how are you doing? You're at the 10 o'clock service. Maybe the action that could confirm your compassion is moving to the 8.30 or the 11.30 service to prove your compassion and let someone else have a seat. Maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe it's mentoring a kid who just recently lost a parent or sitting and getting to know that person in your office who seems to be on the outside, who never engages in the office conversation and parties. Maybe it's stopping on your way to work to buy a hot cup of coffee and a biscuit for that person that you saw standing on the corner. Our action that confirms compassion can look a lot of different ways. But almost every one of those examples that I just gave you require a little inconvenience, require a little interruption to our plans, doesn't it? But Jesus did those kinds of things. He allowed his schedule and his agenda to be interrupted over and over and over again, just like he did for this man by the pool. So it doesn't stop with Jesus. John wrote another passage. He didn't just write the Gospel of John. He also wrote some letters to the new believers of his time. And when he was much older, John had walked with Jesus. He was his good friend. He intimately knew him, and so he's able to clearly outline for us the kind of compassion that Jesus had. And I want to point you to it. It's found in 1 John 3.16. You probably know John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. See, God also had so much compassion that he couldn't sit by and watch us suffer and die he did something about our deep need by sending his son Jesus. He took action. And so in 1 John 3.16, coincidentally, John writes this. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus gave up his life. He literally died so that we could live, so that we could be free. And so when I read this verse, and probably when you do too, it's easy to assume that to give up our lives means we're to die for other people. Now, between me and you, the list of people who I'm willing to die for is a very short list. It's like my husband, my kids, that maybe one or two other people. 
but it's a short list. And so I've always read that verse and thought, I might be out. I don't know if I can do that. To die for someone else, to give up my life. But as I've studied this passage more, and I've thought, what does it mean to give up life? I realize that life encompasses a lot more. Life is not just air in our lungs and blood in our veins. There's so much more to life than breathing. Life is our career. Life is our relationships. It's our plans. It's our money. It's our house. It's our activities. It's our opinions. It's our preferences. It's our comfort. Life is all of those things. And so maybe what John means by give up our life for our brothers and sisters isn't to give up our life in the same sense that Jesus did, as in die for someone, but to give up the life that we have planned, the life that we've imagined, and the one that we've mapped out each day. Maybe to give up our life means to allow our to-do list to be interrupted. Maybe to give up our life means to put aside our comfort and our preferences so that someone else could have a better life. That's what Jesus did. He allowed his life to be interrupted so that we could have a better life. I think that's what John is saying. I want to show you what he says next. He says, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Now don't get hung up on the word money here. John uses that word if someone has enough money, but I think he chooses something that's tangible that we all can relate to, right? We all know what it is to have to give up our money because what do we grip tighter than our money? But I think that we could substitute a lot of different things here. Let's just imagine if this said, if someone has enough time, if someone has enough ability, if someone has enough friendship, if someone has enough love, if someone has enough resources, enough food, enough clothes, if someone has enough space, if someone has enough margin, to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, takes no action, if you will, how can God's love be in that person? I gotta tell you, that hurts my toes a lot. Does it hurt your toes? When I read that, I feel like someone's stepping on my toes because I can tell you I haven't always done this well. If I think about it in that way, Have I always taken action with enough of the things that I have to help someone else? And then John finishes by saying, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I love how he says, dear children, because when John wrote this, he was much older in his years, wiser. So he speaks to us like a father, but I think he also chooses the word children as a gentle reminder that we are God's children. And as God's kids, we represent him to the world. And we represent his love and his compassion to the other people around us. And so John is saying it's not enough to just say that we love someone. It's not just enough to just say that we care and to feel it in our heart. What matters and what speaks truth to other people is to show them, is to show them. I think John is saying, your compassion will be confirmed, dear children, by your action. Your compassion will be confirmed by your action. The man by the pool just needed one person to stop and help him, just one And Jesus chose to be that one, to allow his schedule to be interrupted to stop and help that man, even though he didn't have to. Will we choose to do that? Will you choose to do that? What I've challenged myself with this year in 2019 and what I'm challenging you to do today is to live in such a way that your compassion will be confirmed by your action 
that we won't just merely say that we care about people. We won't just see the needs and know that, we're, that they're there, but that we'll do something about them, that we would care enough to do something, especially for those of us who God has given enough to do it. Your compassion will be confirmed by your actions. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Ask yourself this year, whose life will be better because I chose to be the one to help? Whose life will be better because I chose to be the one to help? You know why this matters today? Because it's the start of 2019. It's just the sixth day. You've got the whole year I believe if you consider this question, it has the potential to change the, traje the trajectory of 2019 for you. That you wouldn't just focus on how your life can be better this year, but that you could focus and think about how someone else's life could be better because of something you did this year. Because you chose to be the one to help someone. So think about those broken lights. You know, when Aubrey fix these lights. I didn't really realize the difference it was gonna make in the whole room, but it changed the whole atmosphere of the room. You don't know the difference it can make because you might choose to be the one to help someone. Think about those broken lights. I don't know who they are, but I bet you've been thinking about them since I started talking. Maybe you have somebody in mind. Maybe it's a grumpy neighbor that lives down the street. Maybe it's a quiet coworker who works in your office or that awkward kid who sits on the outside of the circle during every group project. Maybe it's a family member who's just stopped coming to family gatherings. I don't know who the broken lights are, are in your life, but I bet you do. I bet you've seen them and maybe your heart breaks for them, but you haven't done anything to take action yet. This year, ask yourself, whose life will be better because I chose to be the one to help? Can you imagine the difference it would make if we all chose to be the one to help someone? And I know what you're thinking, April, there are too many broken lights. I don't even know where to start. And if you're anything like me, that's what you think. I understand. It can be overwhelming when you look around at all the needs, can it? But I'm not talking about saving the whole world. Jesus has already done that. He's one. I'm just talking about one person. If you could just choose one person and say, I'm gonna help make their life better this year. I'm gonna take action and show them the kind of compassion that Jesus had for us. If we all could be the one to help someone, who knows the difference it could make? in this church, in this community, outside this community. We don't know how far reaching it could even be. But I bet you've thought of someone. So I'm encouraging you this year, take this year, take this week and ask, whose life will be better because I chose to be the one? And this is just the beginning. Next week and the week after, we're gonna keep talking about how we can be the one Trey's got an amazing message next week. I do not want you to miss it. Come back and hear how you can put legs on this. We're gonna help you with that. But just this week, just start noticing who those people are, who are the broken lights in your life, and consider how you might help them. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the compassion that you have that moved you to take action for every single one of us. I pray that we would have that kind of bold and sacrificial compassion for others, that we wouldn't merely say we care or feel pity in our heart, but that we would be moved to take action and that those actions would confirm the compassion that we have for others and that you have for them. God, give us eyes to see and wisdom to know how to help so that we could point other people to you, so that someone else's life could be better this year because of something we did. For the person in this room, God, who 
feels like the broken light today who would say they need help. God, I pray that they would know the healing power of your hope and that it's not done yet, that there is still hope and that they would be surrounded by people who can help. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us from your word. I pray that we would be obedient and that we wouldn't just hear it and walk away, but that we would hear it and that it would change our life and the people around us. In your name we pray, amen.